What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Dig It Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Walsh, and we're back for another Hot Corner episode. We got our panel with us, Coach Colin Andrews, Dan Perillo, and Andrew Turner. Just wanted to say thank you to all you guys for the awesome feedback we've been getting. We've been having some great dialogue. You guys are reaching out and messaging us, and that's exactly why we do this podcast. So we're pumped. We're excited to continue to move forward. Keep reaching out with feedback. We love it, all right? Today, last last episode, we touched upon the art of fielding a ground ball. Today, we're going to dive deeper into all things double plays, okay? Those are really exciting for us. They're kind of just like the momentum swing of the game. There's a there's so much importance that that has for a defense to sway one way or the other, all right? So, you know, I'm a big football guy. I love watching my Jets and... Just in football as an offense, third down conversions are huge, right? So an offense can win or lose the game on their ability to convert those third downs. And I like to talk about double plays as like a similar sense, right? They're so important. And um, we got to, there's a lot of things we can do to set ourselves up for success. So to get this thing started, we're going to, from the foundation of it, kind of talk about the responsibilities of our infielders, where we want to position ourselves and more of the strategy side. And then we're going to dive deeper into the specific and the approach of turning double play. So I'm going to open this up to the group. You know, what's, what are some of our responsibilities, not only pre-pitch wise, but also positioning wise guys. Uh, I'll, I'll start off there, Drew. Um, you know, you're talking about what are, what's important for an infield um, in terms of double plays, uh, positionings first, let's start there. Uh, if we go around the infield, um, you know, at our level in, you know, high school, you're holding the runner on. So at first baseman, you're holding the runner on at first base is a double play, uh, scenario. So, you know, he comes off once that pitch is delivered, he's got to come off, um, right in front of that runner, ready to make a, a decision on what he's doing with the baseball. Um, and as you go around the infield, the, the main focus of a double play, and you're going to hear it said by all the panelists here today, but those infielders can't be late to the baseball. They can't be late to the bag. If we want a double play to work, things have to move crisp, clean, and on time. Um, so whoever the ball is hit to, the, either the second baseman or shortstop is going to make the turn. Those second baseman, those middle infielders cannot be late to the bag. All right, that's that's number one. You'll hear hear me say it all the time in practice about double plays. Usually doesn't get turned because a middle infielder didn't get to the bag on time. All right, so that's number one. So what do we do? We set those guys up in a position and they cheat. They cheat in normal and and you know if, if everything was set up perfect and and the the guys were in their normal regular positions, we'll bring them in two steps in and then two steps closer to the bag. All right, this is a, a, a different kind of shift. You're shifting for a double play. So two steps in, two steps in the middle of the bag, middle, middle towards the second base bag. You're giving up something, but we're trying to get a double play and we're trying to um, execute a, a defensive double play. So two steps in, two steps towards the middle of the bag. The key there is those guys have to be close enough to get to the bag within three, three and a half strides. That's, you know, that's the, the, what I use as the terminology I use for our guys to get to the bag on time. Uh, and then third baseman, those guys just can't play as deep. You're not playing infield in, you're not playing on the grass. You're two strides behind the, uh, the baseline between second and third. You draw a straight line, two steps behind that. That's about their uh, third baseman double play depth. I love that. And everything you just said is every we can control all those variables infielders. So, you know, if you can't, you got to practice, you have to understand where you are in the field. If you can't get there in three strides, maybe you're too far. All right. Um, so all of those pre pits, all right, understand your responsibility to allow yourself to capitalize on the opportunity the game may present. Okay. Anything else on that coach Turner? I know you have an awesome visualization of some lanes. I would love you to, to go in depth on those. Yeah, I think what, what Coach Perillo said is spot on. And, and just to add to that, like, that's a great foundation to have. And then, like you said, communicating with your infielders, use that as like your foundation. And then 
know, every field you're on and every hitter who's at the plate, you can kind of, you know, adjust, you know, a little bit from there. So if you're on turf or if you're on a slow field up in the Northeast, the four hitters up versus the leadoff hitters up, that's a great framework to have. And you can kind of adjust like one step either direction, kind of just depending on that situation, you know, and that's where like the baseball IQ comes from. Also your pitcher, just to that point, like what type of pitch you have on the mound is also going to play a factor. Yeah. But yeah, to touch on the, on the zones, I know we, we talked about the lanes um, a couple weeks ago and, and just how understanding each lane and where the balls hit um, presents a different play opportunity. And that's so important. So at Wagner, we would do this every single day and, um, at shortstop and at second base, first base and third base, they have their zones too, but I'll keep it the short and second today. But there's about five to six different zones. And then where that ball is hit is a different type of double play feed. So we're talking about the guy catching the ground ball here and how he's going to distribute that ball to the bag. Um, and, and we would rep these every single day. So we did double plays every single day. And we would warm up by I would just have the machine set up where I'd roll the ground balls and we'd start in zone one or zero as we call it take two or three and go to the next one, go to the next one. And we just have one of the coaches on second base, just catching them all and putting them in the bucket. And guys would do two or three at each and warm up. And that would kind of be like our dailies before we got into actual off the background balls. So um, I'll run you through the lanes real quick. And then I would encourage anybody at home. I have these all written down, but to maybe to write them down and I'd be happy to go through them further if you DM me or would reach out. But um, at shortstop, um, the very first one, so it goes zero through five. At shortstop, zero is all the way to your left. And that's going to be one that kind of takes you behind the bag. So uh, just to keep it simple, you're going to run, feel the ball with your glove, and we call it a bare hand or a forehand backhand flip. So you feel the ball forehand and you backhand it um, to the bag. You know, as you're running past them, you kind of throw a backhand flip, show them your palm and flip the ball to the bag. So that's lane zero. Um, lane one, ball to your left. We're not going behind the bag, but it takes you closer to the bag. Feel it with the glove, flip it with the glove. You know, you're close to that guy, just get it in, get it out very close to the bag. You don't have time. You're going to get tangled up. If you kind of exchange, feel with the glove and flip with the glove. That's zone one. Zone two, you know, it's a normal ball to your left, a little closer to you, but still to your left, right or left, your traditional flip, you know, stride out with the right foot and flip. Zone three is going to be right at you. All right. So you have two options with this one. And this is where you rep them both. And then your body's going to tell you which one it likes more, but you have the right, left power flip. So you're going to try and get around it and drive through and you're gonna have to flip with a little more distance. You know, the other one, the other option you have, you see Francisco Lindor do this a lot. You can drop to a knee if you get in the right position and just kind of go and go from one knee and feed it from there. Um, it's important to work on both so you know which one your body likes the most. Moving to our right, um, we go open up drop step. So we don't, we're not able to flip. So I'm gonna to get to my right, get to the ball. I'm gonna drop that left step, pull my left foot back and drop step open up and throw from down there, that lower arm slot that we talked about last week. From there, you can still use the one knee if you want. You know, get all the way to your right, get down on one knee and feed. Our guys at Wagner really, really like that play, especially if the balls hit a little bit harder. And then zone five is all the way to your right. This is going to be a backhand play. So if you have room for a traditional backhand, you can field it and drop step and open up. That one's a little more rare. Or you can go close backhand, pick and stick, or an on-the-run throw. And a lot of times... That throw, uh, if you're all the way to your backhand, especially if you're close, you might only have time to, to get one. So the second baseman kind of becomes a first baseman. Um, but those are kind of the six zones we work on. We call them zero through five. Uh, and then just a side note to add to that at shortstop, anytime you're flipping the ball, you're typically, you want to flip downhill to get your second baseman moving towards the first base bag. So kind of flip in front of the bag, create the momentum for him towards first base. Anytime you're throwing the ball, any, it's a ball to your right. The ball usually took longer to get there or longer to get to you maybe, and you're further from second. So the runner has more time to get to the bag. So you want to throw the ball on the back side of the base to protect him from the runner. So to your left, usually a flip in front of the bag. Um, to your right, you, a throw behind the bag to protect your second base. Um, so that's shortstop. I love that, Coach. Th that's a lot there. Let's unravel that first, okay? Because I'm sure some listeners are like in their car trying to text the notes, zero, one, two, three. So – Let's uh let's kind of zero is kind of off the script play, but I love it. It it it's gotta be you gotta build awareness of it, okay? And that kind of turns in like we said, like you mentioned that backhand feed. It's fun. It's athletic, right? Work on it. Um, the palm up lane one, coach, is that the palm up standard feed? Lane one is uh, glove flip. Glove flip. Flip. Glove flip with the glove. Again, off the script, amazing. You probably won't be able to do it if you never practice it. So when coach screams at you, um, 
you know, just understand what it's, you're developing a skill. It's a tool to add to your tool belt. When you build confidence through preparation, utilize it. Okay. And be, be okay with failing. Now lane lane t- zone two coach. Is that the, okay. That's, that's the standard Palma feed. You see, yep. All over the place. Yep. This is harder than it looks in my opinion, guys. I feel like, you know, l- let's open this up. Obviously the ball has got to be received out in front of your feet. Like, like that's a priority so they don't get tangled. Of course, I think a lot of kids struggle to break their hands quick enough. Um, you know, what have you guys seen? What are some cues you guys use to help some infielders to get that, uh, to not get stuck with that transfer? And then that ball, they break their wrist and, and pull it back. And you now the, the feeds just become inconsistent. So, so one thing I'll, I'll let you guys kind of go out there real quick. I've talked about them a couple of weeks ago, how I like to teach the funnel on this play. I say not the funnel because you don't have time. You know, we did foot- it. No funnel, <laughs> Andrew. I'm just kidding. <laughs> your right foot's got to go. And if you funnel, you're out of sync. So I teach stop and go. And then your right foot goes with your right hand. So that's kind of the way I teach it. Just stop it and go with the right foot and the right hand, kind of like they're connected on a string. So, so kind kill of- the ball, go. Yeah, essentially, yep. And the right foot kind of goes with the right hand from down low. So. You made my day. You made my day. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> Carl, Coach Colin, what do you got? You're about to hop so, in. So with me, with with I see obviously with the younger kids, uh, you know, 10 through 13, it's, it's a lot harder um, with that. I, I always like to tell them I'm tossing from where I receive. So wherever I, I go and field that ball, I'm, I'm, I'm going to shake. I'm going to shake the guy's hand. I'm going to say bye with the glove hand. Um, and then obviously you get the kids that sometimes like to bring the ball back. And, and I just tell them, like, if we're feeling it in between our legs, our arm cannot go past our right knee. Um, just to try and get them to shorten up that toss. I think kids struggle to break their, like, get kill the ball and then clear that front side. Like, get mm-hmm. your glove side out of the way of your left hip because your left hip is now squaring up to your target. And I love to shake the hand. I, and I also love the goodbye. And if you could envision, like, a straight line working through your shoulders, aren't re- extended right palm out, and then your, your glove is all the way behind you to create rhythm. But also, it does get some power on that feed work and low to high because I think kids are – a little bit hesitant and want to go back with their wrist and then break it. Um, but I think, I think the hands just got to play quicker here. Uh, clear that, clear that glove as quick as you can. And then almost re- run towards second base. If you can, like, that's a feel to get kids to utilize that lower half for the feed versus the wrist. Mm-hmm. Cause the, the wrist we want here is going to be a stiffer wrist to, to limit spin and movement on that ball. Yeah. Anything and on that? So you got it. With- with the younger boys, I also see that it's tough for them to clear to the bag because they don't understand. I, when it comes to the double play feeds, when they're starting to learn them, is they have a hard time of understanding, like, the whole – our timing of the right-left field with our feet is to get us going towards where we want to go. So a lot of them are thinking first base still just because they're starting to learn it. So it's right-left, and then they have to go across their hips to try and get that ball to second base instead of having that left foot point towards where we want to go to clear that hit. That's such a great point. So say on a routine ground ball, guys, if, and it plays the first, we're going to be a little – maybe a little more banana-like, like clear the left eye just ever so slightly working towards first. Seconds at a more drastic angle glove side. It's, it's almost like a 90-degree angle at times. So you might want to create a steeper angle going through that ball, which might help you with rhythm, I've found. Instead of going like your footwork is going right, left towards first, now that your feet are tangled with your shoulders. So if we could create a little more like a a part of a Z, like a right to left action going drastic to my left, that might help you with the rhythm on that standard zone two feet. Okay, now we're working on the anything else would go with that zone two. And then the power feed, Coach Turner, is that the one where we catch the ball, actually funnel it so we could shuffle and then break our hands? Or you're just saying like. So this would be um, so zone three right now is the one right at you. So this one I found is probably the hardest one for a lot of guys because their feet are stuck. So what you want to do is try just like a normal ground ball, get to the right of it. And then same play we just worked on, but come through it. But just understand the distance is further. So you just kind of have to use your legs and drive to that same exact play we made just from a longer distance. 
So you're and almost going to get option. a couple strides. Got it. Exactly. And then the other option uh, would just be dropping the right knee um, if you're able to make that play, especially the ball hit kind of hard. And you don't have time to get to the right and then back through it. And and I hope this brings awareness because kids will sometimes like they'll get around it like they're going to go flip it and then throw it because like they're just confused between the two. So they'll get around it. They'll go catch it. And then instead of like they're presenting like they're going to go feed the ball palm up and then last second they throw it and it's just very chaotic. And I can imagine what the second baseman is seeing. Right. It's obviously not going to be a, a calm, cool, collective environment. Which ones do you guys have see more success with? It's a preferential, but do you think, do you guys have a preference with a knee down or, or just what about attacking the ball in the same line and, and receiving the ball with that left hit back and just redirecting it? So I, kids, I, think, if you, I think, sorry, sorry, Andrew. I think if you're teaching the younger, uh, if you're talking about, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, I think Andrew's laying out some really awesome, um, zones where in zero you do this and one you do this and two you do this I think if you're teaching those younger kids maybe limit their freedom in lane three and be a little bit more structured that okay if it's hit here this is what you do and then the more they get better at it the more you can open up freedom and I think there's you know I know Andrew's done a great job with Wagner those are elite athletes that have that base and been was taught uh, when they were younger uh, but I think if you're going back to that, you know, 10, 11, 13 years old, I think you do be a little bit more structured in, okay, one step to your right, get down low, throw from a low angle. One step to your left, I, I think you make it a little bit more rigid when you're teaching those younger kids to, to really uh, nail home. Because they're also not as strong enough to maybe do that power toss, um, even if it is one step to the right a guy at, you know, at Wagner might be able to, or he probably is able to take that right, right foot to the baseball catch and still go underneath for the flip where that younger kid might not be able to do it physically. Maybe that's a skill he learns as he gets older. I love that. And now we're, we're dropping into lane zone. You call coach call lanes, right? Uh, we we would call these zones, but I guess it's just we went like lanes same. for ground balls and zones for double plays, but I, they're kind of the same thing. Just same thing. Awesome. Yeah. So say we're going into lane four now. This is the drop step. And yep, this, this again, like the other famous one. Yep. I love this one. I think it's super athletic, but it's not athletic if you don't have a low slot, you know. So, again, back to the point last episode, like if you're uncomfortable throwing from lower windows, this play is going to be really difficult for you because it's going to have like, once again make you receive the ball down on the earth and have to stand up and probably throw the ball downhill at the second baseman's feet. So, what are some things you like to cue on this this zone or lane four drop step? Do you guys arrive there with a drop step? Do you guys arrive there square and drag? What do you guys got? I like that to get left there. Foot. If you can get there, if you get there early and you can catch the ball opened up already a little bit, you save some time after you catch. Um, if you get there at the same time the ball gets there, you don't have a choice. Uh, you have to do it all in one motion, catch, funnel, as, as I'm sure uh, Andrew would like to hear that, catch, funnel. <laughs> He's funnel. back, 1-1. One, one. <laughs> the, the funnel gives you time to open up that front side. Um, but if you can get there at the same time, or I get there early where you can drop just a little bit. And when we say drop step, I'm talking four inches tops. It's not a lot. Just clear that front side to, to, to be able to create an angle to the to second base. I think that's important though. Like that drop step, I, obviously if it's exaggerated now, if you think there's a door flying open, everything's flying open and, and all chaos breaks loose or you just might push the ball. So we're not saying that left leg wants to fly open 180. That's not the case just a minimal amount to, to allow for your hips to be open. But I, I remember growing up, I was kind of taught like catch the ball square and get rid of it real quick. And I'm like, something feels very unathletic and locked. Mm -hmm. So I really don't like when I see infielders, you know what, they're strong enough and their hands play so well. And they're like, if it's getting the job done, awesome. I'll, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But I see a lot of kids square up to it and then it's just like they're stuck, right? Like they can't get through their hips and they push the ball up into the right. 
What are some what are some cues you guys talk about outside of dragging the foot or arriving there a little early? So for this fall, it worked out pretty good uh, at Fresno Pacific with us is early in the fall in our squads. It was. Uh, let's just say that the double play chances that we got were a little too close at first. So it was bang, bang every single time. Um, bang bang safe and it and it was like okay like we are we are missing a step somewhere like we aren't making up for uh, that step or two at first base somewhere in that play so um, what we broke down um, in our early work was I felt like we were moving so thinking of the of the X is we were all taking the deep angle beating the ball to the spot sitting and waiting getting it out and that's where we were going and that guy was safe or that bang bang play instead of the guy being out by a step or two. So what I had my guys work on was, okay, like obviously if we have time to take that front angle to the ball, I'm going to go to the ball, take my right foot to the ball, receive it with that left foot a little bit back to where I can just field it and get it out. Um, no, obviously if the ball hit a little bit more firm, we take that backside of the X to the ball to where I'm going to field it, drag that foot back and then get it out because you have that time to. But kind of like how I put it to them is if if you have the more steps you can take to the ball, it, the ball's not hit as hard. So that guy's getting down the line. So if you get to a spot and wait on it, like that guy's going, like if we can get to that ball, we'll get that right foot. I, I, I like that. What I said was take the right foot to the ball, receive it and get it out. And that's going to make up for the time. And um, did that with the second base and shortstops. And it's going to make it big difference and I love that and I, I almost like with that w with lane four that you know hip reposition or drop step I almost like the hard angle like squaring up to it sometimes you can get collisional but like I almost like working off that front right x because you could be really aggressive to get to it decelerate with a wide right foot and then just like sequentially open up your left foot it, it I feel like it's super rhythmic I guess once, obviously, like anything, develop awareness of these zones, lanes, understand how to do them in a, at a, a slower speed, and then you could start to add intensity and everything. It, it all fill together, and you'll understand what you present best, how you throw best. Um, on, again, on that, on on lane four, just like we, we've said to Nauseam and Coach Perillo, like getting your getting your glove palm, your eye of the glove on the lane the ball is coming in, again, is super important for these really time-sensitive plays because we don't have time to bobble, rattle the ball around in the glove. So, you know, when, you know if, if anyone's played golf and you see a guy step up to the, the, their first tee drive, they take the club head on the driver and present it to the ball early before they go attack it. Same thing. As soon as you see that ball coming down lane, lane four, present your palm the eye of the glove on that lane so you, your hands have a chance to work really quick we talked to our infielders about just not letting the ball stop like almost think like it's a pinball as soon as it's hit to you and hit your glove redirect it right to to your second baseman nice low to high feed so they could see the ball working uphill because we want that ball to arrive somewhere around the chest if we start to get feeds diving down it's gonna be a really difficult uh, redirect for your second baseman. Um, and it's just going to cause issues as they have a base runner coming downhill. Um, awesome. So again, lane four is going to be a nice uphill feed since we're going to, we're going to break low, throw low to high. Now we got lane five coach what, coaches. What, what do we got on this? What are some things like, this is like last case, like it, it's going to happen. We're trying to square this up. I think this is a, a really thin line between the ball where we're going to our right hard and we almost do like a lateral uh, sidestep or a little like an ice skater to our right hip and load that right hip and go. Or if we can't do that, then we have to backhand it and reposition really quick. Any, any feels, cues on this this ground ball? So when we rep this one out, because um, you're right, there's kind of like that four and a half zone where it's like, can I get there? Can I not? When we rep out um, – zone five here, we usually rep it out backhand. And I kind of tell them, you know, if you can get there a little bit early, you know, get the right foot planted and do like more of a traditional backhand, then you have time to drop step from the backhand position and kind of go low to high. So it kind of combines what we did in zone four, but from the backhand position now. 
Um, if not, where we spend a lot of time on our reps or just the balls on our run, what to do with the backhand when you have a shot at second base. So if you can kind of set up, you can kind of pick and stick where I'm in the backhand position by plant, switch my feet and make a good throw to second. Or if you're on the run, you might kind of just have to make an on the run backhand throw to second base. But a lot of times just understanding, you know, don't be a hero in this situation, get the out because a ball that far to your right, you're probably not going to have time to turn two. You might, but we tell our second baseman on this play to become a first baseman. Let's get the out, give him a throw he can handle, you know, um, and the second baseman's switching his feet and just trying to get the out here and secure the out. Um, so there's different, obviously, variations within that, but primarily a backhand um, in, in that zone five. And I love that. And the only way you're going to know is practice, right? Two things on that, coach. That goes down to the um, non-tangible things. Understand who your base runners are. Like if you've got a good matchup on first base and he's a slow runner, understand that. Maybe you work harder to get in front of it, right? Or maybe you have time to get to the backhand. So th that's one thing you got to keep in mind. Also, get creative. If you know you're not going to get them at second base, maybe a pump fake to first base because then maybe the coach at third base is like, maybe wants in the round and be aggressive on the bags and you could backdoor a guy. So there's a lot of things we could do to collect some outs. Um, I think there's a really good breakdown on, on the shortstop side of things. Let's move it over to the other side of the bag. If you want to break down those zones, coach. Yeah. So I'll run through them real quick and then we can circle back. Like we just did. So second base, same thing. We go zero through five, um, understand everything's going to our right now, obviously common sense, but I think it's worth saying we're going to our right. Um, so the first one, zone zero, is going to be behind the bag again. We call this one our backhand forehand toss. Some people also call it a scissor flip. So it's a backhand, and then we got to field it and flip underneath that glove arm. So a little bit of improv, you know. Some guys are athletic enough. They can swivel around and kind of open it. I found that that throw kind of tends to drift a little bit. So, you know, it's an on-the-run throw behind the bag. I feel it backhand and picture, like, maybe a chopper up the middle, field it, and kind of flip underneath that left arm. We call that the scissor flip. So that's zone zero. Um, glove. Uh, zone one, we're going to be going to our right again, fielding backhand, flipping backhand. So just glove flip right to the bag. That's zone one. Uh, zone two, your traditional underhand flip, you know, field it and flip it. The, the most important thing I think worth noting here is we're going left to right. It's the only time in the infield where we're not going right, left. We're going left to right with our footwork from second base. So that's just your traditional flip like we just did at short, but now we're going left, right. Um, zone three. So we call this the forehand toss or the left knee in the ground. And like Perillo alluded to, it kind of depends on the level of athlete you're working on, but you have two options in zone three. And I learned these in pro ball. We repped out both and the coach would always say, get good at both and your body's going to tell you which one it likes more. So, you know, Chase Utley, I watched him growing up in Philly, does this one great left, right, and extend and show the second base on your palm, you know? So the elbow is extending kind of as your left foot crosses over the body, you know, you're going together. That's kind of more that power flip. That's the first option. Second option, is as you field the ball, you funnel it up, you can drive your left knee in the ground and kind of throw it over the top. So that's just going to be a personal preference. We can field it, funnel, drive the left knee right into the ground, and you can throw over the top. So that's zone three. And um, we'll circle back, obviously. Zone four, now we're starting to move to our left. And this is going to be one you see more often, too. You open and you drop step open, and we're throwing that low to, th that, uh, low to high throw. So... Um, to your left, plant, open up in that drop step, throw low to high. Now, one thing worth noting here, um, the further you are, you know, you might want to turn that into not a not just a drop step, but turn your feet all the way so your left foot is pointed at the second base bag. And now instead of a low to high, we're going to get over the top. So this zone four takes me very far to my left. I can get there, plant. I can pull my feet all the way around so my left foot is pointed at the bag and go over the top. Just because that low to high, I might be too far. I might not get there, and I might not have the zip I need on it. Um, and then zone five, ball to my left. This is our spin play. It's ball to my left. Uh, it's taking me far. I'm in a full sprint. I get it. And I think like a ballerina or a figure skater, drive the left elbow, spin to my left, and make a throw over the top to try and get the ball in the bag. And, again, that might be a play. We don't have time to turn two. You never know. But this shortstop might become a first baseman in that scenario just trying to get out there um, kind of depending on the ball or who's running like we talked about. So coaches want to hop in there, we'll start in that zone, zone zero, right? So this is, again, it starts with these improv off the script plays that we have to start to prepare ourselves. So this is more of that, like you mentioned, almost like under the arm. And I think the pace of the ball could dictate that, like say it's hit harder and it's taking you a little more aggressive towards center field you might have to almost, it's like an on-the-run backhand, 
and you're probably just going to collect one out where you kind of got to get it. And then it's just trying to get, you know, shortstop becomes a first baseman. Let's get the lead out. Keep the, the double play in order. Um, anything on the zone zero zone one coaches? I think for zone zone one, which is the this is zone one that the glove feed. Yeah, so it's usually going to be a backhand, you know, flip it, or it could be a forehand, but you're just in close, and you and you just want to get the ball kind of like a like an alley, you know, pop it up for him and let him kind of come through and take it. Awesome. So then moving into to zone two would be the standard palm up feed. Yep. And again, like you just said, like your job is to just lay it up, right? Lay it up because the shortstop's coming downhill. Allow him to be a, a train, keep that momentum, clear the bag, and get through. That feeds pretty natural outside of the kids just contextualizing sometimes the left, right. Like I, I really like that feed, keep everything in your front side square, like square up to the ball, keep your front side where, where you're going next. And I think everything plays pretty seamlessly. Now, as we get into the further lanes, which three is where we start to get a little more creative, right? Yep. So zone three is going to be either a knee down or the power backhand feed, which those are both awesome. I, like you said, rep out, figure out which one you which, figure out which one you like. Coach, Coach Perilla, I remember a big thing when we did these was keeping that thumb under the ball, right? So if boom, I need to kill the ball in front of my feet. Now our front front side toe or right toe is facing on target. And then sometimes kids will get their thumb on top and that now you just change the trajectory of where the ball is going so everything you said coach turner but if you keep that thumb under the ball you'll stay underneath it and work uphill which is where we want that shortstop to receive the ball uh, working up towards his chest any any feedback on that guys i like the knee down i, I think it, it, it's pretty it's pretty smooth it's grounded like you said on balls hit harder kids out like you know aren't afraid to, to get eye level with the ball they, they get to see that speed, shape, absorb, boom, redirect. And, you know, it just depends on the mover. If they're able to get tilt uphill, if they're not, sometimes kids, if they get high, they, you know, they might throw down. Keep that in mind, guys. Try both. And then anything on that, coaches? It is really fun getting to teach the that 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 feed of the ball that's hit right to a second baseman. Uh, the kids are like 11, 12. Or even to when you slowly start getting into it, the younger guys because they're so used to everything right left, and then when you when you try and get in going left right, it's like their mind's blown. It's like whoa, what the heck's going? On? It's it's super fun to work with, um, but that's I always tell the younger kids because you know at that age it's like every everyone who's cool plays shortstop, but it's like I I always try to tell them like hey like the hardest position when you're young second base because you have to go to your left and you got to go to your right you have to have feet for both you know when you're going to, to go and get a tag you got to get to the back turn your hips around and receive <laughs> it like there's so much more movement at that age you know um so that's always a fun one to try and get them to get outside to get back through you'll see a lot of blends there at the youth age okay now we're working into zone four and th this one's really fun and it's super athletic. All right. So if you think about a lane, you see the lane uh, one or two to your left, you're coming around it. And this is where you got to work hard to get that left foot outside of the ball. And then it's a matter of pace and how you went, the timing and when you arrive, like if you have time to, to get there early and drop step, now your inside hip, your right hip open, that's going to be ideal. But if you don't, work hard to arrive there with that left foot outside your base so now you could decelerate and then it now you got to rely there's two of those right like you could kind of jump off the earth or you could almost just coil those shoulders and get that feed there which one do you guys prefer i i'm if we can i'm i'm repositioning my feet off the earth and i'm working uphill what do you guys got i think i think each guy's a little different um I think you put it out there and you work on one zone, you hit them short fungos and you see which one they're good at, which one they can't do, which one's faster. Get them on the stopwatch. We put all okay. our guys on stopwatches and say, hey, you're really fast at this and you're not fast at this. Why don't you get rid of this? You know, maybe that jump getting off the earth is too slow and they're too heavy and the, the timing's not right and they can't figure it out. Um, but the, we have guys who coil. We got guys who do a little bit of a hop to replace their feet. 
Um, I, I think I think you can go either way on that, depending on arm strength, depending on accuracy. And um, but I think teaches many different things that these coaches are talking about today and see where that athlete ends up with uh, consume. We have guys who can't power flip. We have a starting second baseman who cannot power flip with his thumb down. So we and it's not like you benched him. It's, he's still starting. He's still oh, a he's, really he's good. A good player. He just, he doesn't do that better than he can turn the uh, palm up and do other things. So we just don't power fit. It, it's, it's crazy. I, he's a really good athlete. Uh, but you know, there's, there's just, you have to, you have to teach it. You have to try. And, and when you get to game situation, you just gotta let them compete and, and have enough tools to execute different plays. Before we get in the to zone five, I just, again, that's been a reoccurring theme from all the coaches here. Be flexible, be adaptable. Like don't be so rigid in how you coach somebody because everybody's different. All right. So let the athlete flourish however they deem necessary. Okay, working in the lane five is going to be a spin ball takes you hard glove side. We're probably going to absorb this ball. And then the biggest thing with the spin is like being an athlete, stay low when you're repositioning that right foot's got to be outside your frame. So you don't, your shoulders don't fly open. All right. Cause this is such a quick dynamic movement with a lot of rotation sink into your hips, wide right foot plant. That's how we could throw from the ground up versus, um, you know, maybe that weight taking us out to right field. Any any thoughts on there, guys? Are we we good through the lanes on on zones on second base? Let me go and touch on four. Just one quick thing. What I've noticed with a lot of guys with the lane four is the guys that are comfortable with the and not always, but a lot of guys that are comfortable with that coil in lane four are kids that hit left handed. I found that kind of an amusing thing. And I think maybe, and I'm assuming that they like to coil and they're more comfortable because when they hit left-handed, that's the side that they turn to. And that's their strong, you know, that's that front side. So that was just something that I thought was interesting with the more I've worked with kids is when I see a kid who likes to do that coil, I'm like, what side do you hit from? And a lot of them are left-handed guys. So it, I just found that as like a cool thing. Yeah, it's the same here. I'm a lefty hitter, righty thrower. Mm -hmm. So for me, rotating to my left seems a little bit restricted, even though I'm a righty thrower. Going to my right, I have way more T-spine or thoracic rotation. If you're that guy, maybe it's your feet, your right hip's not opening up, up enough, or do some T-spine rotation, YouTube it. There's a billion exercises and work to the side that feels like you're stuck. What about receivers, guys? Let's Let's take it back to the other side. Coach Turner, I know you have some awesome insight on receiving the, the ball on the double play. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about um, being a second baseman. You guys, much more athletic than me, you guys played shortstop. I got moved to second base and third base quickly. So <laughs> I can talk a lot about second base. But when I was, you know, I learned a lot in college and everything. When I got to professional baseball, we had a really good um, – infield coordinator and we did this every single day he would set up a machine in the batting cage and the last cage or the last tunnel in the batting cage would be the machine and all the second base and we do it for 10 or 15 minutes every day just repping it out and he taught me broke it down into cues you know I learned all these cues and then I learned all these different plays so I'll just start kind of run through the cues he taught me and some I knew before I got there but a lot of them were very new and I'll preface it with this too it's amazing how many kids who are very good baseball players don't know these things like we talked about in our first episode you just think playing infielders catch the ball throw the ball and we lose all these nuances this past summer I coached in the Cape Cod League and our second baseman was drafted in the second round phenomenal player came from a power five program well-known school and he's going to play for a long time this time two or three years from now everybody's going to know who he is one of the best athletes I've ever been around and he didn't know that when you turn two keep in mind he just signed for millions of dollars you were supposed to put your left foot on the bag and I asked him, I was like, you've never been taught this? And he was like, no. He's like, at college, they're a program that's known for just absolutely banging the baseball. They mash. And he said, at practice, we show up, we do about 15 minutes of ground balls. They just rep us out. And then we hit for two and a half hours. So I think <laughs> that's probably what I common. Learned, yeah. And he was still a pretty good second baseman. But we had this problem in the Cape where, you know, we were getting ground balls and we just weren't completing. Like guys are beating it out by half a step and it was driving us nuts. And so we brought him to Indies one day and, and just were like, hey, have you ever worked on, like actually worked on this? Other than just being like a five-star caliber athlete, have you actually worked on the mechanics of this? Do you know exactly what you're doing here? And he said, no. So I spent like 45 minutes with him one day just teaching everything I had been taught. You know, I wasn't reinventing the wheel. 
and that game would turn like two or three double plays. So what I learned just from the last couple of years is how important this is. And a lot of people will say the second baseman is the most important person in the infield, depending on who you ask, because just because of how many touches they get, you know, like you're involved in every double play, whether you're getting the one, the ball hit to you or whether short or third is throwing the ball to you, you know, third baseman is not involved in every double play. Second baseman just gets so many touches. So it's so important. And I've seen firsthand how much of an impact it can have, but, so basically, um, just to run through kind of what I learned, the guy's name is Georgie Hernandez, and we would work on this every day. And his fir first and foremost, he would say, as a second baseman, get to the bag. You know, just get to the bag and find it with your left foot. Get your left foot on the bag. That um, was first and foremost. And from there, just keeping your posture, your left, your shoulders are always in line with the baseline. So you're always first base to second base. Your shoulders are always in line um, with the base. Your head moves, but your shoulders don't. You want to try and eliminate body movement. You know, your head can kind of move to the ball, but try and keep your shoulders square so you're throwing from a good position. Another nuance, your fingers, both sets of fingers always have to be pointed at the baseball. And we'd watch a lot of film on this. Some guys are side-by-side -side guys. Some guys, if you watch the big leagues, are top and bottom guys. But we would do a lot of drills on our warm-up, just barehanded kind of just before we got in the cage, just deflecting the ball and same kind of thing, figuring out which one you like more. I was a side-by-side -side guy, but the more I watch video, it's amazing how many big leaders are just straight down guys. Um, so we do a lot of that. So getting your fingers pointed at the ball and then your fingers, you want to have them kind of as deep as possible, your chest and closer to your left pec was kind of what he would say. And some guys say center, which is fine too. If you want to try and keep your fingers as close or your hands as close as possible to your chest, just to eliminate exchange time. If I'm out here now, I got to bring them in that exchange. If I can catch them here, I can just exchange as soon as I catch it. Um, another thing we're always trying to catch with two hands. Um, but that has limits. So I'm always trying to take my chest to the ball and catch with two hands. Anything within the frame of my body, so the square, you know, you see in my body should be two hands. Once we kind of get outside of that frame, a lot of times it becomes one hand just to make sure we're securing one out and catching the ball. So two hands, but within that frame. Um, and then from there, you know, you want to go right, left, catch at, you know, when you catch the ball. It's very, very important that your right foot is landing um, before or at the same time as your catch. If your right foot lands after the catch, it's a waste of time. So it's catch, right, throw. You want to be catch and right so I can just throw right away from there. Um, and the quicker you throw will just be how, how well you're able to catch that ball, your finger um, your finger direction, how tight you are to your left pec. Um, from there, it's right, left throw. The left toe has got to be pointed at the first base bag. And we, were, we talked about this a lot. Right, open up the left foot, point at the first base bag, and throw uh, for two reasons. One, for the direction of your throw. For prim primarily, though, the main reason is just for health reasons. If that guy slides in and my toe is pointing at the first base bag, my knee bends straight back, I can kind of jump over him and make a throw. If my toe is not pointing at the first base bag, it's pointed this way, my knee is caving in and buckling when that guy slides in, and that's probably a torn ACL. So right, left opens up, and we're protecting ourselves and making a better throw. Um, and we call, that, we call that timing, you know, the right foot hitting when you catch the ball. So those are kind of like the basic nuances and the mechanics of it. And then from there, we're taking our right foot to wherever the throw is. So I'm set up on the bag. Um, you know, I'm always expecting a bad throw, so I'm not surprised by it. You know, be surprised by a good throw, be prepared for a bad throw. And then we had five different kinds of plays you can make based on the three locations of the throws. And I'll run through them quickly. But any throw to your left, you know, you got to step across the base in the front and take your right foot to that throw, trying to catch it in your left chest. So picture a throw from the third base and that maybe sails to his right. He two seams it. I'm stepping across the bag with my right foot, trying to catch it on the chest, point that left foot at first base to make that throw. Then a good throw, which is right at me. Um, I have three options. I can come through the bag. You know, that could be maybe I'm a little bit late, you know, um, ball to the third base and I'm second base. I'm late getting there. So I don't have time to set, set up. I come through the bag, right, left throw. If the shortstop flips the ball downhill, so I'm on the bag and I'm creating some momentum going across the bag that way. Or maybe it's just my favorite footwork. You know, that was the one that I felt most comfortable doing. So on a routine play, I would do that one. Um, the other one on a good throw is bang, bang, play. Runner is very, very fast. So I don't have time to move forward or backwards. Altuve is great at this. It's just right, left, go. And you use the bag as protection, which is right, left, go. You got to get rid of that thing. And the third one is sinking backwards. Um, you can do this. Like I said, maybe it's your favorite throw. So for comfort, you can do this to avoid a runner if you have a little more time. With this one, you might have to drop your arm slot a little bit. So a guy who's a good arm like Cano can kind of drop and sling it from down there. A lot of guys really like that as well. And then 
The last one is just the ball to your right. So let's say that third baseman chokes the ball and yanks it to the left. You got to hold on with your tippy toe, get over there, try and get the ball to your center of your chest, plant and throw there. So what we would do is we just set up the machine in the tunnel at Wagner every day in the batting cages, you know, especially during individuals. And, just, and I would just move the base at the back of the tunnel and that would change where the ball is coming from. So we'd start with five or 10 to your left, balls right at you. You do five or 10 come through, five or 10 on the base, five or 10 sink. And then um, do five or 10 to your right. We actually did this. Um, we play in a stadium, blessed to have it. And we do this before games as well. Like while the other team was hitting BP, we'd go back in the tunnel. And guys love this. They would just do, you know, starting second base on day 20 or 30, just warm it up and kind of get going. And we finished this year at one point, we were top 10 in the nation in double plays. I think we finished top 30, I want to say. And we set the school record this year for double plays. Um, and I think it was just primarily just because of how much work we put on the second base. And, they, and the guys love it. Like it's a very fun drill to do. You can feel yourself getting better. You feel like a stud when you get it in, get it out. Because um, at the end of the day, we tell everybody, like, it's your job to turn two. Third baseman and the shortstop, it's not his job to turn two. It's just his job to get one out of second base. Second baseman's job is to get the ball to first base as fast as he can. And the pitchers love it. Um, they got a lot of good reps in. Um, and there's a lot of fun, too. So, You want to just drop that mic right there? Coach Turner, just drop it. Let that I didn't serenade invent everybody. That. <laughs> that stuff I just learned from everybody else. I'm just stealing and repeating. Whatever that was, that was pure amazing. That was pure gold. I'm like a little kid drooling, taking notes. That was absolutely fantastic. I don't know if you're going to get a breakdown, turning a couple plays that specific. So rewind that, everybody. Go back, write that down. So many gems in there. And yeah, someone might be like, oh, dude, just catch them all and throw it. Yeah, that good luck. Let's see how that works out for you. He, you know, you broke it down in such a manner that is is clear, concise, and flexible and then you worked on it and you coached it and i'm not surprised that you were you saw results right like it's not that crazy that's a pretty straightforward formula just not everybody wants to put in the work all right it's 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 that's a decision they make that was awesome that was fantastic i don't think there's anything we have to add there coaches <clears throat> unless good that was fantastic <clears throat> excuse me Let's take it to the other side of the bag. Coach Perillo, do you have any nuances and feels coming from the other side? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I don't have an in-depth, uh, like, uh, like Andrew did at second base. He did a great job with that. <laughs> um, but similarly, don't try to time it up, all right? We tell our shortstops, get to the bag, expect a bad throw, and instead of, you know, a second baseman, get your left foot on the bag, uh, shortstop, you're going to get your right foot on the bag, okay? And you're going to step with your left foot to where the ball takes you. You're expecting a bad throw. If it's to your left, you catch it there, forward, catch it there, clear lane, and give a good throw. It, it's that simple. And I think, yeah, this this way is a lot e like easier coming through the turn it. Momentum is coming with you. Your direction's coming with you. Now it's a matter of absorbing the ball with you. And, and you got to have trust in your – and your teammate to get you a good feed. You got to work with communication, understanding what feed they like for these different zones. That's going to play a factor and understand what the ball might do as far as a tail. And then from there, sustain momentum. Okay. Get, get your right foot on left foot out. And then, you know, just a, a quick thing I see a lot of kids is either a, they don't redirect their feet right to left, left to target. And they might have their front side facing a little more up the first baseline than, than we'd like. And that's just going to cause them to either fly open or flatten out. And again, it's we don't have time for that. We don't have room for error. Um, or just slots again. You know, understand what slots you like. You have a lot of momentum coming. You want to be an athlete. Don't sometimes kids like to get again over the top, take their eyes off, figure out a slot, a window you could throw with keeping your momentum to your target. Same principles for the receivers, right? If the ball is in front of you, it's or it's in, in that box, redirect it. There's no need to catch the ball there. Work on your defect, uh, deflects outside. You still got to be really quick there, okay? As soon as that ball comes in, a big thing with kids is I don't think they understand that as soon as that ball arrives outside your torso, we got to take that left thumb to chest. Like that, that left thumb could get to your chest. I feel like you're in a decent position to break the ball and transfer and start that throwing process. Coach Carl, and anything on, on the shortstop side of things? No, so with this one, obviously, 
at least when I was growing up, right? It was like, get to the bag and break down the feet, chop them, and then swipe the foot around. And it's still, it's still pretty commonly taught at the younger age. But um, I kind of break it down with them where, okay, if we can get to the bag, one that gives us an opportunity to go and react to that feed, that's not going to be perfect. Um, but if we do get that good feed, I can take, you know, I, I always tell the guys have purpose with your left foot to the ball to where if we really come and get that ball and we get around the bag, our throw is going to be about two feet closer to first base. And if we just get it and replace and then and just kick our foot around the bag. So it's like, and that's usually, especially at that age or at any age, that's a big, I mean, we're, we're, we are playing a game where an inch is a big deal and we're getting two feet. Like, that's awesome. You know? So um, cause I remember when I first started coaching, I had a shortstop who, uh, at the high school level, I was 22 years old. Um, he loved, he, he had a really good arm, but he loved to get their time to come around and throw as hard as he can. But if the feed was not perfect, there were so many balls that went into left field and it was, it was a good learning time to where it's like, get to the bag if we can. Now, obviously there are times where kind of like with the guys at second base, right? Like we were getting there just in time. We're going to come across the bag. Similar thing with our shortstop position. Like, okay, if, if if a ball's hit hard, then obviously we might be getting there a little bit just on time to come around and throw. But if we can fight to get to the bag where we can really have purpose with that left foot coming across the bag and gaining ground. Love that. Hey, double plays are all, they're so much fun. I remember just like the playfulness of it and the creativity. And there was always high energy with turning double plays, especially, especially in a game, right? It just changes the dynamic and energy of a game. It could deflate the other side. So it, it's offense. It's an offensive weapon. And it's really hard, though. There's a lot of things we got to prepare ourselves for. So there's, it's a huge opportunity. Put in the preparation to, to allow yourself to succeed as a unit. Make sure everyone's on the same page. There's so much gold in this podcast. There's so many tangible things to walk away from it. None of it will come to fruition if you don't go work on it. Okay? So if you're a coach or a player, you're a parent, Get out there, write these lanes down, and start with one a day. Start with one a day, start slow, build awareness, and then branch out. And now you could collectively see the lanes and zones and figure out which one works best for you. So, again, so much stuff in this podcast. Coaches, anything that you want to leave on? Good. I think that was awesome. Thank you guys for coming on as always. Thank you guys for tuning in, especially. We'll see you guys next time. Have a good one.